Friends, welcome again to another edition of Tiffin Cast. This is your host, Seishu, and I'm here with Brenda Kennelly from Brooklyn. And Brenda is a, a, a photojournalist, uh, a storyteller, and, uh, well, essentially, she's working on a project that's really captivated my interest, and it's called Upstate Girls. Um, Brenda, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks. Brenda, I want to... I know I've done some some background research on on how you got started and why you got started, but I'd love to have you tell us why is it that you began this project nine years ago? Well, uh, I mean, I, you never. I don't think you start anything and think that you're going to be that it's going to be a project. I don't start things thinking this is going to be a project or a photo project. I met two young women, fourteen. Um, they were from uh, the capital region, Troy. I'm from Albany, so it was really close to home. I had left there a long, long time ago to kind of start uh, a different life than I probably would have had had I stayed in upstate New York. And um, the one girl I knew from an assignment, um, a friend of mine had written a book about her family. Met up with her a couple years later when she was 14, and she told me that her girlfriend was a, a young girl I had met when I was there um, covering this girl, Sabrina, uh, was going to have a baby. And that this girl, Sabrina, who was also in my friend's book, was going to act as the father uh, of the baby. And would I like to photograph the birth? So it was as simple as that. Two 14-year-old girls coming together to create a family for this baby that was about to be born to a very young girl. Um, and so that's how it started. And there was no particular news hook because it was so multifaceted. So I followed those girls. And also it was just kind of a sheer joy to be with these kids. The baby was born in April, to be with them through their summer as they kind of threw this young kid into the mix. So I had been working on this really heavy urban project in Brooklyn, again, with a group of kids who really became family and I'm still in touch with today. But being in upstate New York was so much like a part of childhood that I had, it was almost timeless in a way, going to the river, swimming, kids, you know, ragging on each other's mothers and messing around in bedrooms, lots of giggling, lots of yelling. And I just stayed. And so it then became the project. So that's kind of how I got involved. But of course, you get, as with any relationship, emotionally drawn in on many levels. And, and you, you said you, you're from the area, so it sort of tied very close to closely to sort of your ba your background and your history in a way right mm -hmm. absolutely like 20 well let's see i am exactly 30 years older than kayla who's kind of my main quote unquote character if you will but also my you know kind of like a, a daughter to me um so i'm our birthdays are on the same day october 23rd so i'm exactly 30 years older than she is so i feel like in 30 years something has remained kind of constant. Like I could have walked out of a scene from my life 30 years prior and walked back in and just sort of inserted her as my, um, what do you call those things in the video games? Avatars or Second Life? It was kind of like that. Indeed, indeed. Um, you talked about a little bit of, uh, in terms of access and finding these folks and, and being able to follow them. What is your process in having them trust you? I mean, they don't probably know you from Adam, but what is it that you do to say, listen, I'm here to, to, to do a story on you guys. What is, what, what, I'm, I'm always curious as to what that dialogue looks like or sounds like for a photographer and a subject, you know? Well, I mean, in this case, the one girl who was the baby's, it was Kayla and Sabrina. Kayla was the one who gave birth to the baby, the one who's 30, you know, who has, is my kind of like avatar. And uh, Sabrina was the, the baby daddy. Sabrina was the subject of a friend of mine's book, Random Family, uh, her family. So in this case, I did know them because I, I had an assignment from the Times to photograph what she had been writing about. And there was a situation similar to that in my Brooklyn work where this woman, Adrienne LeBlanc, this great writer, was hired to write about people that I had been photographing. But like in my first case in Brooklyn, I lived in the neighborhood. So there are always people I know. It's not, I've, I've, unless it's an assignment, I never find people like through a set of data and then say, let's find a face that fits this story which you, of course, have to do when you're doing a news story or a story on deadline for publication because you can't, you know, you can't wait for chance. But in this case, 
Um, I think that when I'm really fascinated by people's, the details of their everyday life, like what do you do when you get up in the morning? Mm -hmm. what, like what's your day like? Oh, you put on your clothes that way. Oh, you help Sabrina with her hair and you set the baby D'Anthony there. Like, oh, the baby bottle's in his sneakers. I think people are kind of, it, it's, it's um, affirming. I mean, it's annoying and affirming to pay that much attention to everybody's mundane details. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also obsessive compulsive. So I think that helps. So I think that's a way that a relationship is formed where I'm not looking for the explosive moment where you're fighting or where you're laying in bed on top of each other. Although if that's happening, you know, it's all part of it. So I think if you go in really looking for the small roots of something, mm -hmm. you get everything else. And it, and it becomes obvious that you're not just there for the big stuff. Also, people kind of respect that you sit it out for the boring days. Because with young kids, in both kind of long-term things that I've done, boredom is a key factor. And that's also a key factor in why I get to be there. Because I'm mouthy and I'm fun and I'm like there with a camera. And as I said, it's it's annoying, but it's also... It's something different than you would do in your average day. So, yeah, all of that. Wonderful. Um, so there's a quite a bit of trust from their end, and you probably have quite a bit of trust of them as well uh, because you don't know them really fully well. I mean, in the sense, you, you know, you're, you're not an aunt or, 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 or a mother or whatever. You're, you're just you're, – you are still an outsider, or, or do you feel so much uh, – so much about them that you feel like you've immersed yourself and they, they, there is this bond that, you know, that you can say, okay, yeah, they're, they're not going to mess with me when I'm taking pictures. You know what I mean? Like, are they, do they sometimes do things for you uh, because you have a camera in hand? Do you ever feel uh, that way? No, these kids are, ne I think in Brooklyn, the I, I mean, I know we're talking about upstate girls, but it's sure. definitely been different. And I think that's even part of the learning process of what I'm actually learning in the work. In Brooklyn, even in the most sequestered kind of ghettoized area, in like the purest sense of the word, where it's kind of separated from the other larger part of the city, everybody's pretty savvy. And when I was working here, like rap music and videos and things were coming out. And so people were always conscious of the fact of, how they were portrayed in the media and that they were portrayed in the media and like tough urban ghettos are always kind of looked at. So it almost felt like natural for them to be on the camera. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that was sometimes good and sometimes bad. And so you're working through those kind of moments when people are quote unquote on mm -hmm. to get to the core of their, their lives. Right. With upstate, it's very different. It's not as sophisticated and savvy. So it's much harder. Mm -hmm. Although, there were no racial and ethnic barriers, though so Sabrina, um, her family's, uh, you know, they're uh, Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. But all the rest of the people were like white folks like me. There was no crack cocaine. There was no drugs. There was no, like, big separator of things. But it was just that kind of sequestery, really class difference, working class, as it would be the same as if, or when I do go into my mom's living room with a camera, mm -hmm. she's very, very leery. And it is a class thing. It's not. Um, it's it, it. It's not really a population that's kind of looked at to the degree that I've been doing with um, camera and writing and mm -hmm. talk. You know, sort of interviewing through talk therapy, I guess. Sure. So it was much harder in that in that respect. The other thing I want to say is that in both instances, and particularly with these folks, they're young girls. They're fourteen year old girls. I mean, I can't think of a more amorphous age and sex. I mean, they're always changing. So you can never get comfortable. You, you know what I mean? Like anybody who's a parent knows that their kid isn't the same kid from one day to the next, especially at these ages. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in some respects, uh, it made me think of Lauren Greenfield Field's work uh, out in California, where she photographs young girls as well but in these fancy outfits and, you know, the, the just sort of coming of age kind of thing. But it's a, it, your work is so gritty and, 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 and gutsy. You know, when I looked at it, I was like, wow, you know, I wouldn't know how I would as a man be in that spot. I mean, is there, do you feel like there may be 
a gender bias that because you're a woman that it's a lot, somewhat easier for you to be in certain situations uh, versus a man being in the same situation? I, well, I don't know. Men do very intimate work. I mean, Gene Richards does very intimate work. This a young photographer, Carl Kidsgaard, who did The White Family. He's one of my favorite, Matt Ike. But it's different. It's different, and it's different for a lot of reasons. But the main reason is, I think for me, I mean, when I was thrown in with these girls, a big part of their lives was very um, touching and sexual and things. And I had to be very cautious because of my, my age. I mean, they were 14 and I was an adult mm -hmm. and I had permission from all of their families and things like that, but they were alone in bedrooms an awfully lot. And so I had to use my own judgment. I never showed any nudity. I always respected them in that way. And they were also very protected, you know, and guarded. But I do think that it was easier for a woman in that way because there could have always been some, you know, little joke that someone said, oh, so-and-so likes to look at little girls. And because it's also a neighborhood that's really generated by gossip, I mean, gossip propels it. It is like their urban myth. It, that That's the kind of trust thing, the sort of treachery. Besides the fact that when I was a young girl, I was more like these girls than I was like Lauren's girls, just because sure. economically that's how it was. Sure. But I think at the core of it, getting a group of young girls together, whenever, even if you're their friend and you're the third friend, it's a vulnerable situation. Because I think young kids, especially young girls, I know we could be treacherous with gossip and with making other people feel excluded and included and mm -hmm. things like that. So in that way, no matter how old I am, I'm still a human being and nobody really wants to be the dork of the group. And I think that's the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Being made fun of and being able to come back and be resilient in that right. in one way means that you're very included because mm -hmm. they don't see me as some distant authority figure that they can't you know, make the brunt of their jokes like they do each other. So in that respect, I'm there. But mm -hmm. I'm also, like, really sensitive. And um, so I have to get, sometimes I have to get fit to go there. Definitely. <laughs> and now that I'm old, like, I, like I'm, I've become old in this process, so I'm the, the brunt of old lady jokes. So I have to be able to not be sensitive about that. <laughs> uh, tell, tell us a little bit about, you, you know, how the, the girls themselves have, experience the images that you've shot of them. Uh, t what is it that they see in the pictures that you've created of them? Their parents, largely, especially Kayla, always loves them. Uh, and as time goes on, like if I bring out a picture of, say, Tony, the baby who was born, that the birth of this baby that started it, people get, you know, they love it because it's a piece of their their past. As people die, like grandmothers have died, we just had an incident where the Sanctuary for Independent Media, this neighborhood um, arts organization that's come up, like I guess when I was five years into the project, it's right across the street from them. They put up this wall as part of an NEA grant. It's a mosaic wall that we use for concerts and things. We took some of the photos and put them on tiles in the mosaic wall. And some that I chose were like Tony being born, two grandmothers that have died. People came out from all across the community just to see these little tiles in the wall. So as time goes on, they become very precious. However, because their lives being lived and it's not some place that I go away to a different country, when people change boyfriends and girlfriends, like outgrow, you know how you look at a picture of yourself when there was mm -hmm. like a dorky hairstyle you had sure. when you were in junior high? I mean, that's very much alive when I show things and sometimes they get printed in magazines. So those things, very personal things or friendships change, alliances change. And so a picture that would be welcome is like, oh, I'm seen with her now. It's like you kind of want to deny that part of your past. So that's the biggest problem that I face, really personal things about I'm not friends with this person anymore. I'm not dating this person anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then it becomes like, I have to defend the project to where this, you know, this is part of it and I'm, I can't take this picture down. Not that people ever ask me to do that, but <laughs> if you want to offer something, you have to keep making them know, like, you know, nine years it's going to come out. There's going to be boyfriends you had you might not necessarily have today. <laughs> and so 
I have to do that to get to where you are now. That's the exhausting part. Indeed. Um, on your Kickstarter page, you say this. You say, the Upstate Girls Project is not only a document of the, of the America that we all share with these women, but more importantly, a story of the emotional connections that are universal to being human. Is that summarize your project? I mean, is that, is that what your goal is to be able to document the lives of these young girls in a way that connects us emotionally to them? Absolutely, because when I first started having people edit this, like about maybe at year two, um, depending on who they were, they said, I can't, I, do, I can't like these girls. I can't. And they had these very sort of, and some of these were very liberal women. I mean, liberalism, I think, is the worst thing that's happened to this. Con give, give me like a tea party person, but the liberal, like, I know what's best for you and I'm going to show you the way. Mm -hmm. That's not the way I do my work. I hate that. I'm the anti that. And I think that's the premise of photojournalism is to show the, the, the wrongs and, you know, somehow it's going to change these people's lives. I mean, I think to think that any one thing could do that is incredibly naive and actually, um, uh, what's, what's that word? Justifying. So, and, I, and I can't do that. I've learned through working this way or doing what I do that um, finding what makes me, like, have moments of tears and laughter really finding the commonality uh, and trying to make people connect with that, no matter what you think is best for these guys, no matter what you think their sexuality should be, no matter what you think about birth control, no matter what you think about health care. You know, all of those are man-made systems. And I think in the long run, the core of it is we all want to be loved. We all want to find some way to be remembered when we pass on to the next life or darkness or nothing at all. I mean, we're all born and we all die. And so connecting at points along the way, I think is the best that you can get. And the older I get, as I see this in the truth of my, my own life, um, I don't think I would have had that sort of more archetypal goal five years ago because I'm not the same person. So yes, I think that in the beginning, seeing that people could not connect to these young women and just didn't like sort of get the bad mother jokes and the cursing and the little rough and tumble wrestling that they do with their kids, making that seen as love is the only goal I have. And if I can't do that, then I, I can't even actually put the work out because I'm leaving these guys open for the same judgment that I myself couldn't um, pass muster against. That's yeah. Fantastic! I, I I love, I love the rationale uh, that you know, and the and the background that you've given us about this this wonderful project. Um, I'm looking at your Kickstarter page right now. You have 52 backers, and you've raised eight thousand one hundred ninety-five dollars towards your goal of fifteen thousand. And uh, you've got seventeen days to go. You're looking to raise fifteen thousand dollars. I think you're going to make it because you're you're more than halfway there, right? So. I'm scared. I hope so. <laughs> now, I told them to set it at 10, but the students aim high. The students did the whole Kickstarter. Sure, sure, definitely. Like, all as a group at RIT, and right. the, stu the students did the whole thing. So right. I told them make it lower, and they didn't. So I don't want them to lose faith in me, so I hope people give just for them. No, they will. <laughs> they will definitely give. Um, I have a question. My last question to you is I know you've mentioned the RIT students. This is not just a photo project. It's multi-dimensional. I mean, I don't want to use the word multimedia, but it is. I mean, you've got different, you've writing, you've got video, you've got uh, still photography, all coming together, and you're working with students to put something together for exactly what? What is, what is the end goal going to be? Well, there's two things. It's RIT and also the Visual Studies Workshop. This is a great place in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And uh, they make things. They help people make books, like make books. Like I have five books that are 18 by 12, 18 inches tall by 12 inches wide. And a whole Tupperware drawer full of like system here, like a Tupperware dresser full of little pictures that I'm pasting in this book so there's well five books there's five books and then the website and the website and the book will be like a conversation uh -huh. with each other where each will stand alone but if you want to go online and say see something that comes 
that's in the book that comes directly from a piece of video and you're so inclined you can go online and see the stories unfold they unfold a little bit differently in each place like I have a full collection of correspondence of jail letters from these really young people 16 and the girl was pregnant and he was went in prison when he was 16 and she gave the baby up for adoption and there's like her church and all of that it's and at the same time her sister was also in jail there's a heavy heavy um, juvenile punishment component to it and so that collection of letters is what drives the narrative in book one I and it's, it's different as it plays out on the web in the web you can see like a video still in the book and then go to the web and see if you want to see the whole interview so it's just two things and it's RIT the design students the um, programming students I think we're involving now the gaming department there uh, and of course the photojournalism students are working on this not only to design the website but in the course of it like the one kid who was born I've been gathering all of his medical records and his school records and you and he also he has ADHD and ODD and all these things that are like really really becoming much more prevalent in diagnosis as you know um, basically as we have performance-based testing in schools so you could chart the course of that if you were an anthropologist or even a social worker, you can really, really watch it in this kid and see also that his mother and many other family members have that. So there's all these medical records. So what the students are doing is they're keywording these so we can also make a database. And, hello, there's stuff that I've been doing at the Historical Society, gathering historic photographs, documents, and scrapbooks. Because um, my girls also have done a scrapbook They've been doing this like a participatory scrapbook thing with me for like four years, making scrapbooks, and those are in the books. And they're also audio scrapbooks. So there's all these components that are coming to light, figuring out where to put them in print and in the multimedia, where what's really driving the thing is the, the emotional. I'm big on this phrase called the workshop that I teach now is emotional narrative. The emotional narrative drives everything, and the other things come into play basically to see how those policy things uh, and social attitudes have shaped the emotional narrative. Huh. <laughs> exhausting to say, exhausting to do, and that's why it's taken nine freaking years. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was introduced to you through uh, Scott Cerzante from Chicago Tribune. Um, that's an amazing project. It is. It is an amazing project. That's 14 years and, and on. And yours is nine years and on. Would this project, if it is funded, be sort of the the end quote of the of the project? Are you gonna is this the, the closure for that you're looking for? Or are you gonna continue working with these girls again? Well, closure is something I'd love to do something else. I mean, not that I would not like to do this. The hard part for me is every time I don't go there, something big happens. So it's been very hard to just sit in a room which is what you have to do to organize all this stuff and actually I'm getting older and and thinking that intensely is not as easy as it used to be certainly with doing that and then go like during multitasking so I need to like sort of sequester myself to do it and that's worked but I do want to keep up a connection especially with Tony the child who was born so the way I envision it is the Kickstarter will fund getting the website built, getting the five chapters that we have and that I have sort of in the can put there and this series of five books together. And then since it's the web, I can always add to the last bit of it is Tony's story. I think it was a, a t story that was on Time Lightbox called The Boy from Troy. Mm -hmm. That what I'm doing now is more closely following that child as he is nine years old and mm -hmm. his challenges in the education system and really him growing up in this world because I have, you know, the, the, the privilege of having his life from birth until now. So the focus has shifted a lot from his mom, Kayla, mm -hmm. to him. So I will build on him and maybe do small updates in some way to the website. I don't, I don't know about print publication, but yeah, just, just him, just him. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll never get done. Because there's always something, if everything that your people do is fascinating, and that's kind of where I am with it, then there's no huge event to sort of hook on. 
so you'd never be done. Everything, like every breath is something not to be missed. So you have to kind of just put a blinder on and stop. But it's very hard because then they also wonder like where I am, you know. Definitely, definitely. Brenda, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's Have fun been... editing this. I feel like it was nine years worth of talking here. But no, as I, as I told you, none of none of this is edited. It's just stream of consciousness. We talk. We have uh, a nice conversation. It goes in, and uh, people enjoy it. So it was great. Thank you so much. Uh, right. I appreciate your time. Thank you, hon. Bye. Bye.